hit the big red button. Yes. Okay. All right. I think that's working. Hopefully that's working. Okay. So uh, this presentation is about user journeys, or more specifically, user journey mapping. So if this is not what you expected to talk about, <laughs> let's, let's dive into it a little bit and see whether or not it's the topic for you. So really, uh, this is a presentation where we're trying to answer a couple key questions. So what is user journey mapping? How can this help me learn about user experience and improve? And how does that relate to user stories, user personas, user flows? So really, this presentation comes from a bit of confusion that occurs when we try to talk about user experience. And that confusion was terminology driven. So a lot of times people that I would talk to about either user personas or user journeys would mix up the terms or use them interchangeably. And in our industry, terminology matters, especially when we're talking about the exercises and the purpose of what it is that we're doing. So before we get there, because this is a long presentation and I'm gonna try to fit it all in and be thoughtful. I'm Chad Hester, that's who I am. I work for Unleash Technologies. I am uh, what you call a senior solutions architect, but I wasn't always that. Uh, I started development with Microsoft Technologies about 20 years ago. And then I moved over to the PHP world about 10 years ago, and I learned about Drupal, just like many of us do, uh, just through the community. And I got very involved in the community, and that's why I'm here today, trying to work with you. Um, as a result of being a developer and uh, getting to the planning side of things, I became a solutions architect. I, I mostly focus on information architecture, but I also do a lot of user experience work. So that's my background. So user journeys. They're a part of user experience, and if we're gonna learn about user experience, we have to talk about the learning process as well. It's really important to understand what you're trying to achieve. We just don't want to just go through these exercises to check them off the list. We have to understand the value of them. What are we trying to accomplish? What are we trying to improve? What are our objectives? Begin with the end in mind, as the saying goes. So the learning process, you don't know something, then maybe you encounter it, you become aware of it, you read an article about it, maybe you've learned about user journeys in the past, maybe you've never done it before. And as it goes, we start to study things and then eventually we start to practice those things. And if we practice something enough, we might become masters. And that whole process is something where we need to be responsible for where we fall in these overlapping things. So we may continue to study and continue to practice and go back and forth. And eventually, depending on the topic, maybe it takes us a few months, maybe it takes us a few years, but eventually we could become masters of some topic, some subject. So where does this all fit in? Let's talk about a user journey. So a user journey is what a specific person may experience. And a good example is that maybe you wanna buy a car. Well, maybe I'm a tech person and I wanna go buy a car online. I wanna just have that whole experience, look at the cool specs, look at great pictures. I don't wanna go out to a dealership, but Maybe my father wants to go test drive it and take a look at the different features and talk to somebody. He's a different type of person than I am and that's valid, that's fine. But we have a different user journey. Our experience is gonna be different and therefore our decision processes are gonna be different and we can analyze that. So really, we wanna get oriented we want to answer some questions about that user's journey, and there are tools for that. And that tool for us is what's called a user journey map. So the user journey map is about learning and improving effectively. So with a user journey map, we're typically trying to improve things in a conversion funnel. Do we even know what the conversion funnel is? What is that process? How are people feeling? What are they thinking through that process? Are they feeling badly about something. Is feeling badly a good thing to get them to act? In some cases that is, and we'll take a look at an example of that a little bit later. But really, this is a user experience exercise that helps us inspect that process. 
process. So how is that related to user personas? Uh, user personas are a way of capturing an audience segment. So in the example I gave, maybe I am the persona tech geek and I'm gonna buy a car. Maybe my father is more the baby boomer and that's something that I wanna study through a process. So we can capture these concepts through what are called user personas. So again, orienting ourselves, how do we, how do we learn about these personas? Why do they even matter to a process? So uh, maybe I wanna talk about a teacher. Does a teacher matter in the process of buying a car? Maybe, or maybe not. If we, if we don't think so, then why bother doing that work of building a persona? But we really need to understand that person's motivations in that process. So we want to ask key questions. When we create these user personas, of course we want valid feedback from people, the people that represent that group. It's much better than speculation, but speculation helps. So we have active research and we have passive research. So passive research is things very simply, like Google Analytics or uh, heat mapping or screen recordings. You, you don't know what they're feeling, you don't know what they're thinking, but you can see and extrapolate information about what they're doing. However, things like user interviews, user testing, and other tools that directly touch people and what they're thinking and doing, those are tools to help develop different artifacts that we build, such as user personas. So let's kind of dig into this a little bit. So I know that you can't read this, I don't expect you to, but these are several personas that we put together for an organization, uh, they pronounce their, their name NAGUS, it's N-G-A-U-S, the National Guard Association of the United States. So as you might expect, NAGUS being an association, they have members, they actually have two different types of members. They have corporate members and they have individual members. These are officers in the military or military reserves in the National Guard. Uh, so as you can see here, we have four different personas, the corporate member, individual member, someone that's Congress related, maybe they're a Congress staffer, uh, and then a potential member. Because it's important that if we're studying the behavior of somebody through a decision-making process, well, they aren't a member and then they become a member. So let's call them a potential member. And as you can see, there are different key segments that we try to capture in these user personas. I like to use alliteration because it's cute and it gives a character name. So we have Christopher Corporate, Ian Individual, Steve Stafford, and Penn Potential. And we have a label of what each one of those personas is immediately below that. We have an age and from the age group, is this a plausible age for this sort of person in that role? From that, we can continue to extrapolate things from uh, Google Analytics, like demographic information. So if they're this age, if they're this race, if they're this gender, what are their likely uh, motives? What, what do they do? Do they like investment banking? Do they like travel? How does that impact their decision-making process as it relates to, in this case, Magus? So we try to capture some of that information as well as things like their income level. If I don't have much income, I'm gonna pinch pennies. I'm not gonna wanna make decisions about spending lots of money. But if I have a healthy income, maybe I'll let loose a little bit more and that might be beneficial. And then we write a brief bio about these people because we want to create empathy. We want to give them a story. And more importantly, as you do user experience work, you like to come back to these user personas to put your mind in their, uh, in their eyes. You want to see the world through their eyes. And this helps you do that, whether it's method acting or at least trying to exemplify an exercise. So is a user journey like a user story? You know, journey, story, they sound very similar. Not exactly. Uh, the uh, user story is a very specific thing in our industry as well. So they can influence each other. Really, a user story is about small tasks. Uh, maybe if I'm cooking, then preparing vegetables is one part of that user story. And then after that, I might saute those vegetables in, in a pan. And that's another user story. And I'm a person, and I can talk about that. And I have an outcome in mind. Eventually, I want to eat dinner, right? 
So uh, user stories also help impact things like agile development, as well as user acceptance testing. And they can relate back to user journeys in a way that you can uh, take a look at very specific pieces of the user journey and try to help describe them. But really, it's about orienting ourselves. What, what is this specific task that we're looking at? How, how do we dissect it? And you can keep dissecting. So if it seems too big, just keep going down to the most discrete elements. So user, uh, user story typically takes this form. So we want to know what they're doing. We want to know who they are, and we want to know why they're doing it. So we write sentences like, as a whatever person, I want to, whatever the task is, so that I can, whatever the reason is. So if I'm creating a website for a university, maybe I want to take a look at their financial aid program. Now, if I'm a student in high school, I have a certain set of motives. I, maybe I want to uh, attend an out-of-state school or an in-state school. Uh, I have certain financial restrictions, if you will. So applying for a student loan is a different experience than if I'm a parent. And, and that subtle difference between personas is something that we should pay attention to. And user stories typically help us capture that. That also leads into the user journey mapping that we'll do. So is a user journey map like a user flow? What is this user flow? So yes and no. A user flow is about the process, the steps, the decisions, and it's usually focused on one or very tight systems that work together. Maybe there's an integration point between a website and some sort of a service. That's a valid part of a person's experience as they go through your website, as they try to accomplish a task. But maybe their path through a flow is different than another person's path through a flow. When we diagram these things, we can see how they work and we have the potential to make them more efficient and optimize them. So the point of a user flow is just to simply diagram things visually. That way we can share these things, articulate them, make sure that we're right. Do we understand that this is how it works or how it should work? So it's specifically about the process. So going through the different steps, knowing where you're starting and knowing where you're trying to end up is where user flow is really coming in. And just like our previous example, Magus has uh, a few of these user flows. These are called page flows. They have little stencily types of uh, uh, points that represent individual pages. Again, I know that you can't read the text. That's not so much the point. But as you can see, somebody can start with the home page, go through navigation, make certain key steps, maybe make a decision either they are selecting a membership that they want to choose if they're a new member, or maybe they go down to the existing member renewal process. So that's a different diagram, and that's a different process. <coughs> and that's that next diagram. So we break these up. These are discrete processes that they go through with very specific agendas and different interfaces that they, that they have. So this helps us describe those. At the very bottom, we use annotations because we don't want to clog up the diagram with lots of text. So this is just one form, and I'm sure uh, some of you may have seen other forms of flowcharts. This is just one type. We have uh, a flow for event registration on Nagus, because again, they're an association, they have conferences. So we want to understand how people register for these things. It's important. Uh, writing to Congress is something very specific to Nagus, because they write a lot of things about uh, legislation. And they also want people to act and get in touch with their congressmen. Oh. So coming back to the terminology, user personas, user stories, user flows, and user journeys, they're, they're different, but they're very related and they influence each other. And you need to make decisions as to whether or not you need to do one or the other. You don't have to do them all, but sometimes things lead into the next. For example, with user journey mapping, we typically do personas to help develop into that. So how do we create these? Finally, we're getting to the good stuff. So we recommend that you start with a common template to come up with something that makes sense. And we'll take a look at what we use, and maybe this will help inspire you. But look around. Google search uh, customer journeys or user journey maps to understand how these things are put together and start with that template. So that way, as you make multiple user journey maps, they're consistent. And when you 
talk about these things with your colleagues or your clients, you can start with something that is very consistent that helps that communication. And it also takes less time to build them. We'll typically start also with a user persona to give it some sort of a ground. Who is this user journey about? And we'll put that in the user journey. So if we develop a persona ahead of time, we just copy and paste that right into the journey map. We want to document the sequence of tasks. So what did my father do when he wanted to buy that car? Did he go to the dealership? Did he watch a TV ad? How did he become aware? How did he consider a decision? And then how did he finally pull the trigger on whatever car he bought? So what is that process? What are the steps and can we break that up? But it's not just about the process. That's what those user flows are. This is also about empathy. How did he make that decision? What sort of resistance did we observe? Can we talk to him or an example of someone that's not me, a technophile, someone that's a little more old school? And can we find out what their thoughts are at each step? What are they feeling at each step? So we want to capture that. And what are their touch points? So maybe they watched a TV ad. Well, did I make that TV ad? Did I have an influence over that? Or did corporate make that? Maybe it's a Toyota ad and I just run a Toyota dealership. I have no control over that. But it's a piece of their journey and we need to acknowledge touch points. Maybe they looked at the newspaper. Maybe they went online. These are all touch points and they're very important to understand what you do and don't have any points over. And we capture that. So we break up a user journey into three discrete phases. There's the awareness and discovery. Do I know about this? How did I know about this? The interest and consideration, is this for me? What's pushing me towards that decision? And then the evaluation and consideration, or sorry, the evaluation and conversion. Okay, this is for me. I'm deciding about this and I'm filling out a form, I'm paying for something in person, whatever that conversion is, we want to capture that in that phase. Again, we, we want to try to use user feedback to understand their emotions, their thoughts through this process. But if you don't have access to that, it's okay to method out, become that user persona. Try to put yourself through their shoes. If I'm a parent and fictitious parent and going through the financial aid process, what would I theoretically feel as I go and I literally fill out those financial aid forms? What experience do I have and document the feelings, the thoughts, the experience, where I'm going to do whatever the actions are through that process? It's less reliable to method act. It's a good exercise, but you still want to validate that with real people's feedback. Because making design decisions, what are you building or what are you changing, is really better in the user experience world when you have real users giving you feedback about these things. So we want to push you in that direction. So how do you use this? Like, why are we even making these user journey maps? We want to present these things to stakeholders. We want to present them to users. We want to actually say, is this right? Is this plausible? Is this your experience? Or do you have any corrections? Because again, we want to make good design decisions based on reality. This can help us validate things through learning, and it can help populate things like your product backlog. If you're not familiar with a product backlog, it's a piece of the agile development process. So we can fill that with different tasks. Maybe it's research. Maybe it's building something to test it in an experiment. But this can help give you ideas to put into so really, it goes back to empathy. We're asking very key questions through a process. How is a person feeling? What impact does that have on the decision? So are there good examples of some user journeys or user journey maps? Uh, so there's several online guides for how these things are constructed. Please take a look at them. Don't just take my word for it. Get your research under the belt and start practicing this stuff. Uh, there's a generic example that I'll use, uh, which uh, I put together specifically for presentations like this, but uh, National Guard Association of the United States was kind enough to give us permission to use the uh, information that they provided for us. So this example, I'm just going to go over uh, this because it's very simple and it kind of helps walk you through a user journey map. 
and it's the generic simplified version. So here we have Michael Member. Again, alliteration. It's, it's our cute version of a user persona. He is a member of some sort of organization. He's 72 years old. He's up there. Uh, he is the CEO of Example Corp, because this is our example. He's in Bethesda, Maryland. He makes $200,000 a year, and his personal interests are sales. Okay, uh, so his motivations are he likes attending conferences. He likes connecting with his peers. He stays current with industry trends. He increases political awareness. Uh, preparing for retirement is another thing important for him. 72 years old, he still has yet to retire, but he owns a company. Uh, and he also likes promoting his key services. And we have a bio down here. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but the, the, the takeaway from this is Michael Member, he wants to retire. This is him handing off the keys to some other person to help run the company that he's groomed. But in his late throes in his career, he, he wants to attend this conference to help groom the people that he's uh, trying to get to take over his company. So he read the conference brochure that came in for some conference. This is an awareness phase. So his thought is, a coworker reminded me about a conference. The touch point is a discussion about what happens with this coworker and the brochure. And his emotion is inside of that conference. So you can see here there's this bit of vulnerability in the emotions that happens because that's how we behave through a process. It's a bit of a roller coaster. Sometimes we're happy, sometimes we're sad, sometimes we're angry, sometimes we're just flat neutral. We just don't have a feeling. But this is an important thing to account for because it shows a motivation to do something. Next up is the interest in consideration. So he's considering attending. And he takes a look online to figure out what's going on. He, he says he wants to attend the conference this year. Uh, his secretary reviews registration and timing out and travel options. And he's worried about the expenses. This is a bad thing. Okay. So as you can see here, uh, he's got a neutral emotion. Just planning for feeling. And then he's worried about expenses. Who isn't worried about expenses through a process like this? That's a valid emotion. After that, he talks to his co-workers to figure out, okay, who else wants to go to this conference? Again, this is the interest and consideration thing. We're trying to empathize with how he's feeling, what he's thinking, what he's doing. So he reviews the event option, reviews sponsorship, because as we know, like events like this, you sponsor, sometimes you get a ticket, and maybe it's some tickets, and then you supplement for the rest of the staff that you bring. So he reviewed the registration sponsorship options, and then says, you know what, this works. The price is right. I think it's a good exposure. This helps me in my effort to try to get out of this company by handing off the right people. So, as you can see here, he uh, works with his secretary to register him and two other employees. And again, you can see first of all, here, people on here, along the way, you can see him having a little emotional negotiation to talk about others. Uh, and then eventually, he had a little positive emotions because he Converts. He's happy about his decision. We actually have a little bit further in his experience. So he attends the event. He's the event schedule online. And then he returns to the website and next to his conference. This is another point of conversion that we slip in here because we want to acknowledge that this is important to this specific funnel. So as you can see, we break down what would be a flow. This is one part of the that goes through this. This is the purpose and the value of a user journey map. So just a few more examples just to acknowledge them. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge that these slides, I'll have a link at the very end. So if you want to take a look at them and be able to read this and dissect it, it'll be available for you as well. So Nagus, we, we inspected five different user journeys for five different user personas. For Penn Potential, a potential member, we evaluated the, their very detailed new membership process. What did they feel? What were they thinking? What did they do? What were their touch points? As you can see here, it's mostly on a computer, a few conversations with coworkers or other officers in this case. And as you would expect during the conversion side of things, 
or sorry, during the consideration side of things, there's a bit of a slump in their emotions, usually about money. <laughs> Most people get a little tense, a little worried about money. The next is a corporate member who's renewing. They, a corporate member for Nagus is not a, a, the same as an individual member. This is an organization that has several people under one umbrella, a corporation or other business. And as you can see here, there's a different experience. As you would expect, if, if you don't know this association, your emotions, your thoughts, your, your process of, of signing up is gonna be different than if you've done this before. You know what to expect if you're already a member. Now it's just a matter of renewing. This is a valid process. How about uh, any sort of subscription service that you may have if you remember that you can still subscribe? Do you go through a similar process? If you're a Spotify member, for example, do you consider, hmm, should I renew this year? Probably not because they're usually auto-subscribed and auto-renews, but there are things similar to that in your lives where becoming a, a member or subscribing to something is a different experience than coming back. You, you've already had an experience, but their experience is very specific to that negotiation. Did I get value out of this? Looking backwards a bit more than what a, a potential method had. Did my coworkers get value out of it? In the, sake, uh, in the scenario of a corporate member, they're also talking to their chief financial officer. Is this something that we want to purchase? Did we get value out of the discounts? For example, conferences, publications, and other things of that nature. You can also notice there are different touch points in this. He gets an email notification, talks to people, puts it on his calendar because he got a reminder, I'm not worried about it, I'll come back to this. That's the, that discovery, that awareness. Sometimes that's what happens. If I'm trying to purchase a car, do I do that in one day? Maybe. Or maybe it takes several months. Or purchasing a house. I can't imagine many people have purchased a house in a day. Good luck with that. But I think it's important to acknowledge that sometimes these decision processes take time and we want to acknowledge um, or be sensitive to that. Event registration, a bit more complicated than our first example, but this is the case of what can happen for this organization. So we really dug into that to understand the emotional experience. Mostly positive emotions from what we model, but that may not be the experience for everyone. So coming up with additional user journey maps for different personas may yield different results. Writing to Congress, I, I really want to hang on this one a little bit. So she's not a member, Maria uh, Media. She's, she's uh, a photographer for a media organization, but she, she picked up on some news on uh, the Nagus website, some legislative news about the military. And she read it and she didn't like what she read. And because she didn't like what she read, she, she talked with some coworkers, read some more press, watched some more news coverage on the television, again, different touch points. As you can see, leading up to her version of writing to Congress, you can see her emotion about her This is actually something that you want to expect in this conversion call. If she's not upset, if she's not bothered by something, then why would she be writing to Congress? She's not going to write to Congress to say, hey, I'm happy about it, necessarily. In her case, she's upset about this and she wants to write to Congress because she is upset. That's her personal experience. Maybe there is another person that has a good experience and still wants to write to Congress, but that's not the norm for this exact point. And then of course, the email newsletter sign up. We wanted to explore that for the sake of seeing how conversions happen because with this organization, that's a key funnel for them. Now in this scenario, we teased out something that didn't exist in their current system. The value of a user journey map is to try to see things like this. What can we improve in the system and why? In this scenario, Steve the staffer, he views an example of the newsletter, and that motivates him because he can see, okay, yeah, this looks good. This is topical. This gives me news in a format that isn't overwhelming or inundating or just irritating. I like this example. When we did this user journey map, there was no example newsletter. So that we teased out, and that became the recommendation. So that's user journey mapping. Not too hard. It is a, a very valuable tool. It usually takes a little bit longer to create uh, user personas that go into them than it does the user building uh, maps. However, it can get very deep, especially if you need to do research to help develop them appropriately. 
act of doing the documentation is nowhere near as time consuming as getting good, valid feedback from users. So I like to encourage continuous improvement. We all grow, we all have professional development, we all want to try to keep up with the trend. So in this situation, I would highly recommend for anything in user experience like in this field, find yourself a mentor. It's so much better to have a guide, somebody that's done this stuff before. I personally have a mentor, uh, Vanessa Turk. Uh, she's uh, a Canadian and uh, works out of Vancouver. Um, she's helped guide me over the past about seven years in a lot of uh, different user experience exercises such as this, and it's helped me attend social events, try to give talks like this, because teaching is also learning. So I have a bunch of links in here. I don't expect you to write all these. <laughs> and it's probably hard to read, we one uh, So that's bad usability on my part. <laughs> but uh, I do want to point out that there are some good resources out there in the user experience world. And so much so that it may be very overwhelming. Uh, so user personas, user stories. Uh, there's a really good book called User Story Mapping by O'Reilly. Highly recommend it. A fantastic book. Even reading the first chapter alone will send you spiraling down the rabbit hole of how to do user, uh, user story now. User flows. There are so many different ways to do diagrams, but I can tell you this, don't write about the process in text. Diagram it, create the visual. This is the engaging thing that helps talk among your peers and uh, across clients and with people in your company. It's important to diagram things so that way you clarify your understanding and then figure out how you can make improvements. So a bunch of good uh, things. And a couple user journey maps. So even just some examples that I can get. There are plenty of examples uh, for this. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say that Emily's technology is hired for uh, a few key positions. If you're interested in uh, talking about that, so let me know. So thank you. Uh, any questions, feedback, here's the link. And I want to give a special thank you to uh, Vanessa Turk, who is a career student in Canada. Uh, my wife, Stella Guest, who worked with her, as well as Magus for all the discovery material that went into this. Any questions? Any slides you want me to go back to? I thought that was on in like an hour. Well, Um, so you're asking if I start my process with a positive or the negative to try to prove it? Okay. That's, that's a really good question. So you're, 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 you're asking if I start with the notion that they will convert. Uh, no, absolutely not. Um, I, I think that these are good exercises to try to prove yourself wrong in those scenarios, especially when you have good user research to contribute to that. Um, I mentioned earlier the, the notion of doing user journey mapping uh, using these personas like characters in a play and method acting as that person. So I'm, I'm not personally a parent, but there's nothing to prevent me from method acting as if I'm a parent of a high school student applying for financial aid and going through the process trying to think the way they are. But that is no substitute for talking to parents. You want to talk to them, you want to do good user tests. So in other words, put them in front of those systems and give them tasks. You don't guide them, you don't want to introduce bias, but you do want to see how they behave. Um, and the best way to do that is to give them a handful of tasks. Okay, here's what I want you to accomplish. Um, here's you know, my understanding of you, maybe do an intake interview, and then have them do that task. Just watch them. Silently watch them, take some notes, uh, or have them on video if it's uncomfortable in some scenarios it is. And then afterward, do an exit interview as well. Try to understand where their pain points were, what they liked, what they didn't like, and see how that plays into what goes into the journey maps. If they just consistently fall off, that's part of your user journey. They never make it to the first, and that's valid. And if we, if we to your point, if we're always expecting the positive and only documenting the positive, we're missing an opportunity to improve. So if we 
show that sharp fall off on that big empty area on the right hand side of our, our document for some of these conversion funnels, we can bring that back to a client or a peer and say, look, this is what the data says. We want to get them there, but they aren't really because of these reasons. You can see that sharp decline in their emotional state, or you can see uh, some of the thoughts that they're having, or where they're getting errors on screen, the page was a code, it's an access denied, something like that. Okay, so the question is, how do I do user research for this or in general? Um, that is a very broad uh, answer. So, again, with, with research or exercises, you can really go down the route. There's so many options that can be overwhelming. The first thing that I would recommend is to begin with the end in mind. Try to understand what it is that you're trying to answer. So, usually what I'll do is try to formulate a question or a series of questions. Like, and like this good scientific process, I'll come up with a hypothesis and see if I can prove that wrong. So there are different tools depending on what type of question I'm trying to answer, and I'll try to use multiple tools where possible. So some good examples. If I have a theory that on a website, they have really terrible navigation and nobody's ever making it to the loan application page, for example. I can use some passive research tools like heat mapping and section reporting and see whether or not a person's actually make it there and pull the data from that. But that's, I'm not talking to a person, I'm not testing it. So I can do a user survey. That's pretty low cost. Uh, sometimes you want to incentivize people to participate using things like gift cards or other incentives. And there are good articles about how to get participants in these things. Uh, next would be actual user tests. Sometimes these tests can be remote if you get good participants. Um, sometimes they can be in person. Sometimes they can be so high fidelity you're using like eye tracking software and things like that. Um, for example, there's nothing invalid in user experience research to say that that applies to multiple industries. If I wanted to make a new car dashboard, how do I know what dials go where or where different uh, things go that people interface with for a pleasant experience? It's all the same field. These are uh, human behavior fields. They're engineering fields. So as you can see, the rabbit hole gets very deep because you start incorporating people with different areas of expertise. So the question then becomes, do I need that? Is, is that cost getting increased the value of what I'm trying to change? For websites, I don't necessarily need a human behaviorist to come in to decide where a button uh, but there are certain key exercises that we can do. In the case of user journey mapping, some of the common tools that we use are just taking a look at uh, analytics, taking a look at uh, session reporting, just seeing what people are doing. Those are very low cost tools. Um, and sometimes doing like user surveys to tease out who they are, how they're feeling about things. The challenge that I've experienced in a lot of those exercises is avoiding introducing bias or leading the witness, if you will. That, that I think is the, the common thing. So what I would recommend when setting up a scenario is just run it, bounce the idea off of somebody and say, look, does it feel like I'm being biased? Does it feel like I'm pushing them in a direction? If so, I, I wanna rephrase this a little bit and, and tease it out. And then when you run it, that, that's starting to incur the cost. Does that answer your question? That's, that's a fantastic question. So the question is, how many personas do we make and how detailed do we want to get? So I love the phrase good enough uh, because a lot of times that helps us make decisions as opposed to perfection, which is a fictitious thing in most cases. 
So uh, what you're talking about is uh, a gradual sort of process. A lot of times what I'll do is, um, if I'm starting a new project or if it's an internal project, I start off with just defining audience segments. And as that name implies, there can be sub-segments as well. Let's play an example. I love the university example because it's very identifiable. If I want to take a look at high school students who are applying to student loans, that's a potential user for some. However, the experience for in-state tuition versus out-of-state tuition is going to be different. So those are two sub-segments that we choose out. So I would make personas for those two if I'm studying. So it really depends on what exercises am I putting these personas for. Um, and that will make a recommendation of what it is. So it's kind of a phased approach. So first, what are the audience segments? Just, let's just bullet list them out. If they're sub-segments, sub, sub then they become children of that main segment. But we can tease it out. And that can change over time. We change, they change, our business or organization goals change, so things that they can do for them. So really reorient the question on, what am I trying to include now? What's good enough to focus on now? And even if I have these 15 personas, here are the two that I want to focus on. And you just tease those out. Sometimes just pushing through that will inform what you can do for the rest of it. So it becomes a very valuable tool to like just dividing content. Does that answer your question? All right. Anybody else? You might be sprung early. Sorry if I talk too fast, but all right. Good stuff. Maybe we can get some coffee.